Thanks, uh, Terry, and uh, <coughs> welcome, everybody. I will just say a couple of things at, at the start with regards to, to Philologi, just to, to do the sales pitch, so to speak. If you are interested in joining Philologi, friends of the, the Logi collection, um, then do make yourself known to myself or either Terry or Alice, um, yeah, or Mal at the back, so our secretary, after the, after the actual talk, and we can, we can let you know how to sign up. Um, it's, it's very cheap to join, it's $20 and we have the occasional event uh, and you get, you, you get insight or invitations to events like this um, generally before the public does as well. So, uh, so yes, it would be great to see a few more people joining and for those members that are here, I see a few, we will be having an AGM, hopefully by the end of July. So we will Okay, come through, come in. That's all right, we're just about to kick off, so excuse our tidiness. <clears throat> so we've all come out tonight on uh, what is a cold winter's night, finding a car park too, I hear it's been rather difficult, but um, we've come out tonight to talk about or to hear about sex, or to be a little bit more specific, sex in the Roman world. In a nutshell, that's basically what we're going to be talking about. Let's begin with what we think we know about Roman sex. So today when one hears or thinks about the Roman world, it is, I suspect, a range of television programs, movies, books, artworks, like the one on the screen, or for some, pornographic clips that create or reinforce an impression that ancient Rome was a hotbed of sexual excess, depictions and descriptions of wild sexual orgies, overindulgent parties, and upper-class women sneaking off for secret encounters with gladiators or slaves to the forefront in the imagination. In such reconstructions, ancient Rome is a morally barren world where incest, murder and adulterous affairs were all political tools and a part of the fabric of society. Even if we, in our more rational moments, doubt the reliability of some YouTube clip or the BBC's I, Claudius, recognising them for what they are, modern inventions, the framework remains. Part of the impression sticks and we associate these scenes with reality at least on some level. So the question is, are we right to do this? Is our understanding and these modern representations accurate? Are the depictions true? Mary Beard, a now very well-known Cambridge professor, answered this question with the following, and I quote her, some of it is, some of it isn't, but often we just haven't a clue. <laughs> and I think she's right. And I'll also expand on that last point by adding, and some of it we actually think we know, and we invent and present. And that's not what I'm doing tonight, but it's a long list of things. In other words, there is uncertainty around how much of the material that I'm going to present to to you. So we don't know a lot of the information, so there is uncertainty. We have to take that particular point on board. And you also need to be aware that a lot of what I do present is from the perspective of an elite Roman male. That voice is the loudest. It is his pers perspective that actually dom dominates our understanding of antiquity. Not just with regards to, to sex, sexuality in Roman society, but all sorts of aspects of the ancient world. It's the elite male's voice that we hear the loudest and clearest. So where does that leave us? Well, my aim tonight is to use sex and sexuality as a window into Roman society. In doing so, we will challenge some of our 20th century reconstructions and stereotypes. Nevertheless, by looking at the rules, practices, values and beliefs that the Romans had regarding sex, we can understand more about their lives. And you can begin to understand a little more of what it may have been like to live in a Roman household in a Roman city. As you'll see, sex is a visible and important part of Roman society. And our discussion will introduce a whole range of questions that we can only begin to address here. What I'm particularly interested in is everyday life. My intention is to introduce the sex life of an everyday Roman, of both a husband and a housewife in inverted the place of slaves and prostitutes in the sexual environment, also that we can reach a fuller understanding of relationships, power dynamics, and therefore understand the, the urban Roman environment a little better. So let's begin with a couple of topics 
that at first glance may appear to be a little bit tangential. Roman social status, or the hierarchies in Roman society, and Roman demography. Yes, you come out for a talk on sex and you get statistics and numbers. Okay, <laughs> bear with me though. What I want to do is actually give you some context within which to place our broader discussion on sex and relationships, and they do tie in as we work our way through. So let's begin with, with Roman status, and I apologise for the slide. I thought I'd be able to find a really good one online, but I had to hurriedly make, make, make this one up um, this afternoon. The point, and the point that the slide is trying to emphasise, is that Roman society was very hierarchical and very structured. From the time of Augustus, the emperor obviously is at the top, followed by the wealthy elite senators, men who traditionally had a political role helping govern the empire, were leaders of Rome's armies. There were a few other wealthy individuals as well, the equestrians, the local elites, but together the senators and the equestrians numbered in the thousands, and the population in Rome of around a million in the early imperial period, uh, and maybe 55 million across the empire itself. In other words, the hierarchical pyramid in Rome has a small number at the top and a very broad base. Nevertheless, where one sat on that pyramid, where one fitted into it, was very important to the Romans, especially the elite. There were clear divisions with clothing and attendance, or the lack of them, helping demarcate your place in society. So our takeaway point is that status is important, at least in understanding the way Roman society was meant to work meant to work according to the Roman models, the Roman elite models. And I'll come back to this comment on the reality of Roman urban life uh, for the masses later on towards the end. The second observation I want to emphasise are the population statistics, which are perhaps best emphasised by the mortality rate. Anyone know what the life expectancy is, was of a Roman at birth? Oh, wasn't meant to go up. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> okay. So there you go. Mid twenties. Twenty five is the approximation that we usually usually use. So why was it so low? Poor health and hygiene. That's the short answer. Child mortality rates were very very high. The high early death rate helping to explain the overall low life expectancy. And by high mortality rate. I mean very high. Note um, the statistics as they come up on the slide. 30% of children died in their first year of life. Many of them not surviving a month. Um, many died in that first month of life. 50% failed to make their fifth birthday. Paints rather a stark picture of life in Rome. Those who reached 10 did have a little bit better. 50% thereabouts would reach the age of 50. Maybe 17% could be as old as 70, but we're not talking about large portions of the population at that particular age. This still means that very few people would reach old age, as we understand the term. Consider how in Rome, 50% of the population was 20 or under, and 80% would be dead by the time they reached if we use the UK as a comparison for today, 20% of the population in the UK is 65 years or older, and there are more people in this group today than there are 18 or under. So it's a very different picture. The demographics in the world today, the Western world today, is a very, very different picture from what we see in Rome. Age distribution is very different. And if you look at those statistics and delve into them, it soon becomes very clear that ancient Rome was actually a city dominated by teenagers. <laughs> Start thinking about how that would affect sexual activity. Okay. There's one other aspect to this discussion and, and sort of setting the scene that I want to delve into, and it's important to us. And that is that with such a high mortality rate, there also needs to be an equally high fertility rate or the Roman population would have simply disappeared. And this is one of the reasons why Paul Crystal, in a very recent book, which also happens to be titled In Bed with the Romans, um, which I discovered after I'd actually 
decided to do this particular talk and came up with a title. And it is a good book, I discovered, and it's quite accessible, so I, I do recommend it. Um, he actually opens his book with the following statement. Some Romans spend a lot of time in bed. Statement, that statement in itself is provocative. And part of me does want to stop here and, and just see what we all think about that, but I'm going to continue because Crystal goes on to make a few other rather important points that will come to the fore during our actual talk. And that is, illness or hangover recovery apart, they were often busy procreating or, in the case of women, procreating and giving birth. Serial childbirth was an expected duty of a Roman woman particularly of the matrona, the Roman citizen's wife, just as virility was required of men. Now, <clears throat> Crystal here is alluding to both the need for Romans to reproduce and that it was an expected duty of a Roman woman to give birth to legitimate children. This requirement is part of a more elaborate social expectation uh, and includes ideologies around the continuation of family and the maintaining of property within a family life. Very briefly, it was important for a Roman male that his family line has continued, the wealth of his household increased and passed on to his children, and the need for children is recognised through distinctly Roman values, um, not an explicit understanding of population figures and the need to replace the population. However, if we keep this line of thought going and think about the mortality rates, the number of women available for marriage and remarriage, and so who was available to actually have the legitimate children needed, then we could ask just how much time would a Roman woman have to actually spend in bed? We can measure this to some extent by how many children she actually needed to have. It turns out that for the population to replace itself, Every Roman citizen woman would need to have five children so that two would survive. Of course, not every Roman woman could have children. Some would be infertile. Some would have husbands that were infertile. Some would lose husbands to conflicts and diseases. The end result is that women who were able to give birth would have to give birth to around six to nine children just to maintain the population level. Of course, um, <clears throat> to do this, women, or more accurately, girls, had to begin having children early. The legal age for marriage was 12 for girls in the Roman world. Amongst the elite, many would marry between about the ages of 14, 15, the ordinary Romans, ordinary Romans, sorry, would marry um, a little bit later, a couple of years older perhaps. We know though of some who married a lot younger, or at least were promised to their husbands at a very young age. Nevertheless, once married, they would then begin what must have been a continuous cycle of getting pregnant and getting birth, giving birth, sorry. The very point that Crystal makes in that earlier quotation went through. So as an example of this, I want to introduce you to a Roman woman, to Vituria. We know a little bit about her from her tombstone. The Romans don't just give us names and dates in their funerary inscriptions, quite fortunately, they actually give us quite a bit of information on occasion about their life and who they were. And so you can see um, from the actual slide, in this particular case, we know that Vituria died at the age of 27. We don't know what the cause of her death was, but it is speculated in a lot of the literature that complications in childbirth was a, a possible reason. Um, this was a very real danger for women in the ancient world, and it, it's not unreasonable to think that that could have been the case. But look at the other points that come out of that particular slide as well. She had been married for 16 years. <coughs> Do the maths. She married very, very young, before the legal age. She had six children. Only one of those children survived. Again, do the maths. Assume that she started having those children around the age 13 or 14. She would have had one every second year, constantly producing a replacement child. 
and only one of those six. I present this inscription to you because her story would not be unusual. It demonstrates the reality for many Roman women. Marriage at an early age, followed by a continuous cycle of getting pregnant and then giving birth. Now we'll come back to these Roman wives later in the actual talk as I try to tie a whole lot of different topics together. But right now I want to digress onto an aspect of the Roman world that is very different from today. And that is the attitudes of the Romans towards sexual imagery. My point is that, se that, that sexual sexuality, understood in a very broad sense, was very different to what we find today. And this, I hope, will become clear. The most obvious way that this is seen, especially by visitors to Pompeii, for instance, is through the erect phalluses that are everywhere. The phallus, of course, is sexual, and it is masculine. Part of what we have on display in Pompeii is a representation of male power and presence in Roman society. Some have taken this to the extreme, suggesting that even the Roman forum is laid out like a penis and testicles. Unlikely. But phalluses celebrating Roman manhood are explicit and a common sight. There is, of course, far more going on with this particular imagery as well. Plutarch, for instance, tells a story of how the god Mars appears in the court of Elba Longa, a mythical Roman city, as a phallus and ends up fathering Romulus and Remus. There are, in other words, links to Rome's origins and achievements inherent in the depictions as well. There is also important symbolic significance in cults and Roman religion. A phallus is represented as good luck, and it warded off the evil eye. So perhaps an analogy that we can relate to is that they are the horseshoes of the Roman world. At any rate, it is this protection role and the granting of good health that sees the Roman phallus in many everyday items and places. It is fashioned as wind chimes, lamps, bread, on wine flasks and street signs. And you'll see some images shortly uh, which include uh, some depictions of, of the phallus of various forms. This everyday presence demonstrates that there was no embarrassment or shame connected to the imagery. It was part of the normal, everyday landscape. This observation is only the beginning of what is a much larger topic on the widespread presence of sexual imagery. Mosaics and pictures of sexual activity were part of the fabric of Roman lives. As many will know, such images were present in brothels, and we'll discuss those shortly, However, many erotic pictures were found on everyday items, in homes, in areas frequented by all members of the family. Images of sex were part of what everyone saw. They were a part of life, and they were a part of society. And I've got a, a selection of, of images here that we can flick through of everyday items, which have all sorts of different imagery, uh, sexual imagery depicted on them. So here, obviously, this is an oil lamp um, with, a, with a couple uh, in bed uh, on it. Here we have another depiction of a, of a, of a phallus of an erect penis. Again, an oil lamp. Here we have a hand mirror, which is probably used by, um, by a woman. They're present on everyday, everyday items. There's a whole range that I could have actually put up. It's the same sort of imagery. It is just, it's everywhere, basically. And it's also on a whole range of, of pictures uh, within households, not just in the brothels, not just in the bars, the areas that we might actually expect to see some of the sort of imagery, but we also get it, get the imagery itself, uh, in villas, in the bedrooms, in the houses, decorating the various uh, houses all around, uh, all around um, Pompeii and Herculaneum. So we've got uh, an example there. Here, um, we actually have a, an interesting case. This was uncovered late last year, November, uh, December of last year, in the um, excavations that are occurring in Pompeii. And uh, they discovered uh, this, again, in a bedroom, in a villa. And they discovered this particular image later in uh, the swamp of Zeus. Um,
So we can add more to those images. I mean, I could have put a whole range more up that just the same sort of things. But on top of that as well, we have the love poetry, we have the erotic plays, we have the raunchy satires. They were all read, seen, and heard by men and women. There were sex manuals. Suetonius tells us that the Emperor Tiberius kept a collection of these books on Capri. While Ovid wrote what one scholar describes as Rome's version, or the Romans' version, of the joy of sex. In it, he runs through various sexual positions, providing instruction, for example, on the positions that a woman should adopt to achieve mutual orgasm with her partner. And he encourages her to fake it if necessary. That can be very convincing, with much flailing around and gasping and rolling of eyes. Dinner parties, of course, were another area where sexual themes were apparent. Many would have included explicit mosaics with visual representations of attractive partners of both genders for guests to admire. So what does this mean for us trying to understand Roman society and sexuality? The main point I'm trying to make with these observations is that concepts such as erotica and pornography, or to put it another way, the categorising of explicit imagery, along with the associated embarrassment and shame found in later eras, including our own, is something that would have been alien to the Romans. Their values were different, and their society was different. This does not mean that all aspects of sexual activity was accepted or accepted. There were social stigmas attached to a range of different activities such as males being penetrated. But more general sexual activity, as we've, as we've seen or, or depicted, that was seen as normal, and they were depicted in, in a range of imagery and represented right across Roman society. So let's pause here, and we'll take note of the one exception that I mentioned, males being penetrated. There are other sexual acts that the Romans um, also object to, but for our purposes, this one will suffice. To explain what is going on, we need to go back and think about that social hierarchy that I looked at right at the start of the lecture, and look at the social context of a male um, being penetrated. We also need to think about Crystal's opening statement and the final point that he made regarding male virility. Remember, a woman was expected to produce children, a man was measured by his virility. What is meant here is not just the ability to father children. Rather, the key Latin term is virtus, which emphasises the masculinity of a Roman, indicating manliness, military prowess, strength, bravery, as well as virility. Demonstrating these attributes demonstrates power and emphasises his social position. In a sexual context, this ideology means that a man should be active, not passive. More explicitly, in terms of acts, sexual acts, a man should penetrate and he should not be penetrated. Roman societal values suggest, therefore, that a man could copulate with women or with men, but only as the dominant partner. Being used by another and being penetrated was a sign of, well, I've written weakness, but it's more a sign of, um, of, of submission, perhaps, um, can also be used in some terms as representing feebleness and perhaps even in some uh, cases to indicate uh, depravity. Seneca expresses it this way, and it's the last point there on the slide in red. Sexual passiv passivity in a free man is a crime. For a slave, it's a necessity, and for a freed slave, it's a duty. More than that, it was a significant insult to, to refer or label someone as a man who enjoyed or allowed his body to be used for pleasure by others in sodomy. Such a man was called a stitus, a pervert, a catamite. Some of them were referred to as effeminate men, and they tend to be slandered in our texts. Gaius Lucilius, who, was, who wrote in the second half of the second century BCE, he, for example, refers to freeborn men who made themselves available for such acts as asshole operas. While there are numerous examples amongst the graffiti from Pompeii that uses sexual acts such as anal sex, 
as a way of labeling, labeling an individual or insulting and defaming them. As an aside, it does appear through some of the literature and some of the imagery, and we'll see some later on, that some women found the more effeminate man attractive. And many scholars speculate that some of the sex scenes that involve two men and a woman, which are the images that we will see later, uh, include depictions of such individuals. As you would expect, they'll be the ones in the middle that are penetrating and receiving. But to come back to our current discussion, it is clear that sex, or more specifically one's sexual partners, and one's roles are also an expression of a male's power, his manliness, and so his worth and standing in society. Of course, if a man was secure in his power, then for some transgressing against these norms could be deemed erotic. So some emperors or powerful individuals partook in a variety of roles. As an example, we're told that Nero used to prowl the streets of Rome at night looking for well-endowed men. We also have to remember that anecdotes described by, histori by historians living a hundred or so years after those individuals lived, so Suetonius, Tacitus, say, writing about the Judeo-Claudian emperors, some of, those may, some, some of those historians may simply be making allegations as a way to attack an individual's character. In Nero's case, there's probably a bit of both going on. That is, reality and character assassination. I can't really leave this part of our discussion without commenting on, um, maybe making some comment with regards to homosexuality and heterosexuality. I simply do not have the time to delve into all the connotations of what is actually going on here, but I do want to emphasize that these labels, homosexual and heterosexual, are not Roman. The inference being that the ideas that are caught up in these terms for us may not have been so important for the Romans. The reality is that in Rome, sexual acts between men are acceptable if those acts are within a defined framework. It is also clear from the literature that some Roman men preferred men to women. The usual preference is for young and pretty youths. This is what's depicted on the slide with a bearded man underneath penetrating a clean-shaven youth. Note two, the young, the young boy that is uh, peering around the door is a boy there are, of course, always exceptions to such generalizations. And Suetonius, for example, notes that Galba, the emperor, referred older and hard men. We have a lot of different imagery of, of men um, together. There's this statuette, for instance, of, from the Naples Archaeological Museum. There are plenty of other images as well. And we'll see a couple of them when we look at uh, prostitution. Uh, but the point is that the practice was reasonably, it was accepted under certain conditions. When it comes to sexual activity between women, the situation is equally complicated and fluid, with the added problem that there is less information to go on. In brief, lesbian is not a Latin word. The most common term used to describe um, lesbian seems to be trabades, which originates from the Greek tribo, which means literally to rub. In the first century CE, Trivades is used to refer to women who lie together, and it is not used as a neutral term, but one to denigrate. Elite Roman men are vocal in their disapproval. Their judgment seems to be centered around the concept of penetration, once again, where a woman is deemed, a woman having sex with another woman is deemed to have to use an object, a dildo, uh, on the other, that's seen as a perversion of the male role. And so again, it's the elite male perspective that's coming to the fore. None of this, of course, means that lesbianism, as we understand the term, did not exist. We have images of women together. We have graffiti from Pompeii, for instance, where one woman, for example, addresses another as her lover. From Egypt, we have some spells. And I've given you one there on the actual PowerPoint um, as well. That was paid for by one woman in order to gain the object of her desire, which is the affections of another woman. The extent to which women sought out other women, though, for sexual relationships is where our evidence fails us. In fact, I think that here, instead of trying to speculate, we're probably just best to revert back to Mary's bed's summation, 
that there are some things that we simply don't know and can't necessarily reconstruct. I want now to return to the marriage bed. Marriage in the Roman world was needed to produce legitimate children and was the way in which property was transferred between generations. I've made that point a couple of times. Roman men were concerned with being certain that any children conceived during a marriage were their own. And all the rules around marriage and adultery are based on that premise. It's a generalisation, but that's the basic understanding of what's going on. In short, a husband had a reasonable amount of freedom under the scenario. Sex, for example, with slaves and prostitutes were permitted, at least by law. We know less, on the, we know less about what his, wife, what his wife might have to say on this particular matter. And before we dismiss her opinion as meaning nothing in what appears to be a very patriarchal and misogynistic society, consider how she may have brought a sizable dowry to the relationship. She, in the Roman world, could divorce her husband, and he would have to repay that dowry one that he is using to support his household. This is one way that she can exert influence and control within the relationship. So she might have something to say on that matter. Alternatively, if you consider the picture we presented earlier of the need for a Roman woman to produce children to maintain the population, some woman may have gladly looked the other way, hoping for a little bit of respite. A bit flippant perhaps, but the point is that relationships are complex. And while the laws might say one thing, the reality may still have been very different. Although to be fair, there is enough anecdotal evidence to suggest that Roman men could and did partake in liaisons outside of marriage. Intercourse with prostitutes is one obvious example, and we will look at that in a minute. The Roman wife, meantime, was limited to her husband, at least in law. Roman men, however, seem to think that their wives partook in numerous affairs. Of it, the author of the ancient world's equivalent of the joy of sex, got into trouble with Augustus, in part for writing on how to conduct adulterous affairs. Ovid advocates sitting next to your lover at the races, so you can flirt with her, touch her, and perhaps brush imaginary dirt from her breast. Or you, or you both attend a dinner party with your spouses, but have a secret sign language to engage and tease one another. Of course, how many of these affairs are real, how many are a figment of, of men's imagination or insecurities, we cannot tell. I would remind you, though, that many of the women we are talking about are actually teenage girls, some married to men who are considerably older. The Emperor Claudius, for example, married his third wife, Messalina, when he was 48 years old. She was 14. Are we really surprised that she took a series of lovers and had a whole range of affairs? The life of a wife further down the social status pyramid faces a different reality, but similar pressures as we'll come to see. But before we get to her, we should perhaps look at the one of the most visible aspects of sex outside of marriage, and that is prostitution. In the Roman world, prostitution was legal, and the use of services provided was widespread. Some of our authors some of our authors condone brothels and their services because they would stop married men trying to seduce other men's wives. In reality, brothels seem to have had no problems attracting clientele. Services, for instance, were cheap. Graffiti from Pompeii suggests that prices were as low as two to four asses, uh, which is less than the sesterce, uh, and the daily wage for a casual labourer was around four sesterces have on the next slide, but we'll put that now. I've got those, those figures for you on this down the side so you can actually try to make sense of them. So an S was, was a, a unit of currency, same with a sesterce and a denarii. The point that you probably need to know is that the, um, the daily casual labouring wage was around one denarii, so four sesterces, thereabouts, 16 S. The costs or the prices for services, as you can see down the left-hand column, which I'll leave to, to read for, you, uh, for yourself, generally speaking, is around the two to four. That's what comes through. Two to four asses is what comes through uh, in a whole range of different literature. This is just some of the, the stuff that I've, that I've actually put up there for you. And for those of you that were looking around in the, in the 
museum earlier, you might have picked up that the price of a, price of a loaf of bread in the Roman world was about two asses. So the cost of going to a prostitute was similar to buying a loaf of bread, thereabouts. Um, there are, of course, variations in the price, and you can again see that from the selections I have put on the slide. Uh, the one out, the, the, um, the graffiti from outside the Marine Gate in Pompeii is one example. Uh, Attica, she's uh, relatively expensive compared to, to everybody else in that particular list. At these price levels, prostitutes were really readily available to the majority and can be seen, like the gladiatorial games, as part of the bread and circuses ideology, keeping the male masses happy. I don't disagree with this assessment. I think we can assume a little bit more, though, if we consider the discussion on demography we introduced earlier. Remember, half the population was under the age of 20. And while women first married quite young, men tended to be a little bit older, their first marriage occurring probably in their early 20s and even their 20s. One suspects that teenage and 20-something boys were amongst the clients of Rome's prostitutes. And that would stop them trying to suggest, at least in theory, uh, the wives of other Roman males. I also suspect, although I'm not sure I'll ever be able to prove it, that Rome's urban population was not a 50-50 gender split. I suspect we would have found more men in Rome than women. Many sent by parents who remained on land holdings outside of the city while their sons earned some additional money to bring home. Some of these men coming into Rome may also have been married, their wives staying safe, in inverted commas, on the family plot of land. And the sexual needs of all of these men were in part provided by the brothels of the city. Prostitutes themselves were often slaves. Perhaps captured, especially as we come into the imperial period where the conquest has stopped, and Rome's expansion has stopped, a lot of these were captured by pirates, press ganged into service. And on the slide, I've given you a passage from Seneca describing how a kidnapped victim is bought and sold as a prostitute. And it's pretty grim reading. These slaves were set up to work in establishments like the famous brothel in Pompeii, images that you can actually see on that particular slide. Now, I've included the, the image on the top right for those of you who may not have been to Pompeii and could be planning a trip there uh, to actually suggest to you that you get to the town early and you go through to the brothel first or fairly early. That's a queue, a queue to enter into the brothel. It's extremely popular. <laughs> now, that queue's down the side street. The brothel's right at the back in the far distance. It goes for some, some period of time. And effectively, it's a fairly small building. You enter into the front, which is the bottom left slide there, you go around the corner and you go out another door at the back and down a back alleyway to get out of it. So um, there's a long queue when the tour buses start to arrive, so get there early. Anyway, <laughs> the rest of it shows what the actual brothel itself is like, and that's what we're here to actually discuss. So you can see the front door over to the bottom left, and you can see one of the cells there uh, in the bottom right. So they're small cells, obviously. And they have cold stone beds, which stand in stark contrast to the erotic, um, the exotic and erotic scenes painted in the, in the main hallway. In that main hallway, for those of you that haven't been, you can't really see them on that left hand in that left hand slide. I will show you again some of these very very shortly. Uh, but there are all sorts of elaborate erotic scenes um, of what could be taking place in this particular in this particular building. Those images very different from the cold stone bed and what's in, in the reality of that particular cell. Um, of course, there would have been mattresses, there would have been cushions and fabrics adorning, uh, um, in these particular, adorning uh, the room, so in the rooms themselves, but one still suspects that the setting promised in the images was actually far from the reality. Anyone who's visited this building will also know that the cells are small and there is not a lot of ventilation. The rooms would have been dark, dirty, and smoky. And that also comes through in the literature. Those that visit the brothels are described as having the brothels soot all over their face. So they're small, dark cells, effectively. And one sense that people do tend to ignore when they go and visit these is the sense of smell. So 
these rooms, this whole brothel, would have also smelled. It wouldn't have been a necessarily pleasant environment. Privacy too was limited. A curtain probably covered the doorway, but then if reality followed the widespread visibility of sex, was privacy actually expected? I suspect yes, for a range of reasons, um, but still, it's a point to contemplate when you actually get a chance to visit Pompeii and walk through this particular building. Of course, there were a variety of bro bro brothels, all offering different standards of service and presumably experiences. Some had baths and hairdressers that were attached to them, with boys holding scented bottles of water for clients to clean up afterwards. So there's a whole range and level of services that could be provided. The brothels themselves were not the only places where sex was for sale. The bars have a strong link to sexual activity. The murals in the suburban bars demonstrated, uh, demonstrate this quite clearly. And you can see that in those slides, although they're a little bit difficult to make out. I do have, you will see some close-ups of some of those uh, shortly, some of those particular images shortly, but you get the idea of, of what's actually going on. Plus, of course, we have the usual graffiti um, in the building itself or in the various bars and the like as well, naming prostitutes, indicating available services, or bragging about having had, in inverted commas, certain individuals. Of course, many of these claims will be no different than graffiti in, say, toilet cubicles in more recent times, or accusations made on social media where lies are spread by dump lovers or simply over-imaginative over dreamers. It is, however, safe to assume that sex and the baths went together. In the early empire, Nudity for men and women was the norm at bars, and while some establishments had separate wings for women, mixed bathing became popular, evidenced to some extent by Hadrian's unsuccessful attempt to ban it. Do we really think that naked teenagers at bars didn't lead to sex? <coughs> Here, too, is another image from the bars. Um, and again, as I know that we'll get to see some of these actual panels a little bit clearer shortly, but you'll get the idea. Prostitutes were present at the bars. They also plied their trade on the streets, under juvenile stinking arches, and even in some of the elaborate tombs that stood outside of Rome's city walls. The street and tomb workers would have been among the more desperate. Perhaps they were freed slaves with no support or skill to fall back on. They were desperate and survived any way they could. And as an aside, although the idea of slavery itself and, and the whole idea of women, of course, being treated as slaves and put into these sorts of professions, um, the reality in Rome was that a lot of these women in the brothels were probably better off as slaves where they at least had a roof over their heads and had a meal than when they managed to get free or they managed to escape and they were desperate and living on the streets and they were trying to survive and using prostitution again to try to survive and practice in the trade in the tombs or under the archways or uh, various, uh, various sort of shantytown type uh, structures uh, on the streets of Rome. Now of course, our conversation or our discussion on prostitution has been dominated by female prostitutes, providing services to men. From the graffiti and from the literature, we also know that male prostitutes were available. Some of the male names, the services, and prices from the graffiti at Pompeii I've included on this particular slide. One thing to note is that the prices are very similar to what we saw to the woman prostitutes. Gender is not an issue in this particular Perhaps the most interesting aspects though of this graffiti, and you can see that as you read through the various services that are offered, is it appears that male prostitutes were available and used by men and women. The prospect of Roman women using prostitutes is actually something that split scholars. Many are very reluctant to accept this as a reality or to accept that this could have occurred. Yet, as you can see from this particular imagery and the passage from Juvenal on the side, in that slide, it is attested in a variety of ways. Personally, I think we have to be naive to think that it didn't actually occur, that women didn't actually have access to male prostitutes. 
Full intercourse may have carried potential risks, obviously, for the woman, but that wasn't a problem if she was already pregnant, a point explicitly made by Julia, Augustus's daughter. Alternatively, as the slide shows, there are plenty of other options that were available as well for women, and as Julia makes explicitly clear in that passage that I'll put up there as well. Finally, we should also note that the imagery from bars and from brothels promises an array of possibilities for clients, including group sex, as this slide, slide actually suggests. The slide of two men and a woman is interesting in another way as well, and that it again shows a difference between the Roman world and today. In modern pornographic scenes, we might well actually expect to see a woman in the middle of this role, in the little role on that particular image, not a man as we have here. I pointed out as an observation, and you can make it that what you will. As far as group sex in Rome is concerned, I suspect, I suspect that was probably an occupational hazard, or a business opportunity, depending on one's perspective and role, participant or pimp. For prostitutes of both genders, it would just be a reality. This next slide shows another group sex scene. This one reinforces some of the ideas and values that we have discussed earlier in the lecture. The figure on the left is male, and it can be a little bit very difficult to make this out. So it's written, the description's written on the side, but very, very briefly. We have the figure on the left who is male, and he is in the dominant position. He's highest, and he's the one that's penetrating another male who's in front of him. He is waving to the viewer in the process of doing this in triumph. So he's the, he's the one that's in the dominant position and the highest power and social standing. The second figure, also a male, is being penetrated and is receiving oral sex from a woman lying on the bed. She, in turn, is receiving oral sex from the final figure, another woman kneeling beside the bed. There's one thing I should emphasise um, uh, with regards uh, to prostitution and with regards to these sorts of activities and scenes is that I suspect that the reality for prostitutes was a very hard life. Nothing at all like what you see in any of the scenes. Most would have lived in abject poverty. Some would have been riddled with disease. And for others, violence, pregnancies and dangerous abortions would have been the norm. To close, I want to return again to the marriage bed in Roman society, and consider what the world we have presented in all of those images and the discussion that we've had so far, consider what that world is actually like. Without doubt, it is one very different from our own, where sex was more visible and perhaps more readily available. Our discussion to date, though, has avoided reality and emotions, at least for many who are among the working masses. To a large extent, this is because of the nature of our evidence. But occasionally, we can get a glimpse into the everyday world, as we saw earlier with that, that uh, funerary epitaph of Maturia, a young mother who died at 27, having given birth to six children and burying all but one of them. Another example of the everyday is on the tombstone of a little girl who dies of a mysterious illness just before her ninth birthday. That's the official inscription um, up there on the slide now. What this shows, if you read through it, is we have a couple, we have Marcus and his wife, whose name is actually scratched out on the inscription. And her name is Acte, and we find that, you'll see shortly how we find that out. At this point, they're happily married. They're not part of the elite, but they're what we might call ordinary ones. Anyway, it seems that they were blessed with the birth of a baby girl, whose unfortunate death, some eight years later, clearly fills them, with, fills them both with grief. So far, all seems to, to be what we might expect in a normal Roman household. However, it turns out that the death of their daughter causes problems in their relationship, and soon the mother is seeking comfort from another. She has an affair. She eventually leaves her husband for her lover, taking some valuable marital property with her, namely two slaves. 
The ex-husband is left alone, a bitter and grumpy old man who curses his former wife to all that will listen, wanting her to be consumed by burning pitch. We know this story because it's scrawled on the back of the tombstone by Marcus, a bit of post postscript condemning his ex-wife and preserving the record of her affair across some 2,000 years. This story, and others like it, are important because after looking at values, attitudes, and practices that are both similar and different from our societies, our society, sorry, stories such as this reintroduce, reintroduce the human element. It reminds us that people and emotions also have a role to play in our reconstructions. And as Mary Baird reminds us in her telling of this particular story, we only hear the version of events from a bitter, guilty husband. What would Acti's side have been? A young bride, perhaps, trapped in a marriage with an older man. In the aftermath of her tragic loss, she is desperate to seek freedom and seizes an opportunity. The result's a new start and perhaps a new hope. We do not know if this is Acti's story, but we do know that these relationships are real and they existed within the societal framework that we've uncovered and discussed tonight. The beds of the Roman Romans may be a bit different from the orgies of modern imagination, but they are no less complex. Thank you. All right, I'm happy to take some questions if people have them. I'll do my best to answer them or I'll call on my colleagues to read for them as well. Yeah? When Constantine became Christian, how did attitudes change then? So, well, as, as religion comes into play, and as Christianity in particular comes into play, it, it's one of, the, one of the, the variables, I suppose, that leads to uh, shame around the imagery leads to sort of the shame um, around that erotic imagery uh, and a change of attitudes towards it. It's one of, of over time, one of, the, um, one of the influences that changes the way that society, especially Western society, begins to look at some of that imagery. I mean, a lot of those images were offensive to Christians, and so they debased them and uh, caused damages, damage to them. But that was also a slow, slow process, and there were other influences that play as well over time. So it's just one of the, one of the, one of the many sort of components to an evolving story. That one introduces a whole range of different. Um, there's, a, there's no simple answer, really, because um, you've got a whole range of different peoples as well. So you have the you have this layer. Even that's a wrong way to look at it. But in a simplistic form, you've got a layer of, of society that's sort of governing over. All. They would have adopted and adapted some of Rome's attitudes. But you've also got a lot of local practices and beliefs that are that, that come into play. So it's a very difficult question to answer. Good one though, and it's, it just shows how complex this whole topic is and, and how you can go into it. Yeah? Um, you mentioned when um, a Roman wife left her husband that she took her property with her? Yeah. Well, she so stole some of the property. So you're suggesting that she had, she, that when she married, she didn't relinquish her property rights? Um, not necessarily. In that particular scenario, she may have just taken them. She was free, if you actually read through that description. So, make it off. But um, in, the second, in the, uh, the second part of that inscription, you actually see that she was free by her, by her husband. So she had been a slave. She may have had some connection or relationship to those other slaves. We don't know. So we don't know the full story. And so she, she takes them with her, whether she, they were her property 
whether she stole them, whether they were part of the marital property, we don't know the full story. But they would listen it. And he was very bitter about that. Could, yeah? could be also that the girl and the boy are, are all the children. That's right. That's but another part of it. belong to the father. So there's all sorts of unknowns in there. But the, uh, the, the bigger picture with regards to, to that particular question is that the reality for them is very different from what the laws and what we might actually understand the way that Roman society operated. Yes, Roman society was very patriarchal. Yes, it was very misogynistic. Don't want to try to, to disprove that. But there are, the reality of life for women, especially women that actually had some of their own property mm. and some of their own, uh, own wealth independent, is not necessarily how the laws would suggest. So women could own property. Women could work. In Roman world, and they did. Women could run businesses, and they did. Own farms, and they did. And so that made the, the one woman had independent wealth. And we have stories about about young men that especially tried to chase after these older wealthy women, so that they could access access their, their wealth further down the track. But they become quite powerful within society too. So there's a whole. The reality is complex, just like any society. It's not <coughs> simplistic. Yeah. Um, your colleague from Seneca, can you tell me, I, I, I put this probably up there, but I didn't notice that, um, where was that quote from and which context was it writing it? Which one? Um, <laughs> something to do with <coughs> um, penetration and freed men and slaves having to do it, or something. I can't remember, it was at the beginning. <laughs> and it was at the bottom, I think. Maybe if you pop up after, and I'll, I'll find it in my notes, and I could actually ask if anyone else is interested, and I'll give you the details that I've got. I think I actually put it on my, my own slide, so we can sit through the slides. Yeah. Anybody else? Let me see. Yeah? Um, yes, you had a slide up showing the prices for prostitutes, for mm -hmm. female prostitutes, and in that slide, it used the F word. So was yep. that in the original or authentic advertising? Yeah, yep. I, I contemplated it. putting the Latin in there instead of the F word, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, it's it's that's what's scrolled there. It's, it's that explicit. So. Yep, and lot, sorry, and a lot of the other graffiti. You often read a lot of the graffiti and stuff in, in textbooks, and they they do sanitize it. A lot of it mm -hmm. is explicit and uses that sort of language. Um, yeah, given. And child mortality, but also the mortality of mothers was quite high. What would happen in terms of like a child rearing situation if you had a mother die in childbirth and there were already kids there? Would the father immediately try and find another female figure to fill that position or take on both roles? Well, lots of things. There's several answers to that. First of all, in the Roman world, the children are the fathers. Okay. Right? They don't go with the mother, they go with the father. Um, the, the second thing is, yes, there's a lot of blended families. So as people die, then um, they try to, Roman men, and try to find another wife. And there are lots of stories about stepmothers and, and, and the like in the, in the literature as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of blended families, that, that, which is the reality uh, within a Roman household. So, um, so yes, yeah, so you would have, especially when, while a woman is still in her childhood, so it, it, same thing goes with the other way around as well. If a, if a male dies, again, it gets a little bit complex. But generally speaking, the reality seems to have been, if that woman's still in her childbearing years, then she will probably be married off to someone else. A woman who's only married to one husband is celebrated in the Roman world um, in an ideological sort of way. But the reality is that we have a lot of remarriages, we have a lot of divorces, and we have um, a lot of blended families. That's the, the usual makeup. Right there, and your adoption. <laughs> adoption comes into play as well, where you will adopt. All right, maybe we'll call it an end there. Um, hope you enjoyed the talk. Mm -hmm.
but we'll see you there with some other talks as well. I hope a few of you might enjoy for the Logie just to go extra stuff.